Uh, I wanted to thank Panina for putting this together, and the theme is Wanderers, but the secondary theme might be Borscht and uh, Immigrants. And actually, Margarita and I both uh, immigrated when we were two, and we both went through Vienna, so that's, that was an interesting fact to learn. So I'm reading from my book, How to Get into the Twin Palms, and I'll start at the beginning, and I'll jump forward a little bit. It was a strange choice to decide to pass as a Russian, but it was a question of proximity and level of allure. Russians were everywhere in Los Angeles, especially in my neighborhood, and held a certain sense of mystery. I had long attempted to inhabit my Polish skin and was happy to finally crawl out of it. I would never tell my mother. She only thought of them as crooks and beneath us. They felt the same about us. We were beneath them. It had always been a question of who was under whom. I see a couple from the Twin Palms fucking against their cars across the street from my apartment. I'm hiding behind the newly purchased ficus on my balcony and watching them. I wonder if they know each other and I want to know what he's whispering to her in Russian. I'm a few feet away from them, in it with them. And I want to know if she's a suka or his wife. <laughs> For the Russians in the crowd. He wouldn't be fucking her like that if she were his wife. He grabs at her and she lets him touch her roughly and I wonder how he would touch me. Is he a cab driver or a businessman? He turns her around, face toward the car and pushes her against it. He moves his hand in between her legs and pulls one up around him. She doesn't hesitate. I whistle. He stops breathing and says something in Russian that I can't understand. I lean forward, trying to hear better, still hidden behind the bush. But it doesn't matter. I'm not hidden enough, and he sees me. The woman says something to me in Russian, spits on the ground, pulls down her dress, and pulls up her panties. He buckles his belt and zips. They walk quickly back to the Twin Palms, and I sit outside on my balcony, hoping to see more, but no one else comes to fuck from the Twin Palms tonight. <laughs> if you walk by the Twin Palms during the day, you would surely miss it. The doors are green and it looks like a rundown relic of old Los Angeles. The sign is yellow with a drawn on palm tree. The cabs are gone and the street is empty, clean of cigarette butts. I want to get inside the Twin Palms. I want them to ask me what I am. So I wait for the cabs to come back, for the Russians to swarm back like birds. The stores on Fairfax are called Apteka and sell prosthetic body parts and humidifiers and medicine that I have never seen before. They are next to grocery stores that sell aging fruit and herring and halva. I hate herring. In tubs with oil and onions, the silvery pieces curl onto each other unmoving. I should love herring. I should love borscht. I should slurp it up with pumpernickel or rye. As I walk down the street, the smell overwhelms me. The smell of rye bread and ponchki filled with prune jam. The yeast smell from the bakery overtakes everything and keeps it an immigrant neighborhood in Los Angeles. There are Russians and Ukrainians on my street. They are not like the Russians in the Twin Palms. They wear plastic shoes and stand with their socks pulled up. The men wear shorts and their bellies hang down and out of the ye their yellowing undershirts. The women weep, the men yell. I see them watching me through their crocheted curtains, waiting to see who comes out, who comes in and who comes out of my apartment, picking the ones I should be ashamed of. The next night, something is happening in the Twin Palms, and everyone going inside is dressed in fur. I want to really see them, so I lean up close to the women in their coats as I walk through and feel their silver foxes and minks brush against my cheek. The coats smell like the one my mother used to have, the one I wanted. It was a silver fox, and she used to wear it all the time in Poland when she was young, the age I am now. 
My grandmother had a fur too. A sign of a good husband in Poland is one who puts you in a silver fox. Long or short, long is better and more exclusive. The women in the fox furs don't appreciate how close I am to them, how my face touches the scruff of their arm, the mink of their sleeve. They curse me in Russian, suka, bitch. In Polish, bitch is kurva. Was suka a whore too? Who else but a whore would rub her cheek against their furs? I watch them walk up the stairs and want to follow. I round the corner and hear the sound wafting down the street. Suka, suka, suka. The women go upstairs and the men stay behind, smoke, snuff out cigarettes. I try passing again. The men stare at me in their black leather dusters with their eastern bloc homemade haircuts a custom they never gave up in America. Hair falling in between linoleum squares beside refrigerators, ovens, the mist unswept tufts accumulating. I catch their eyes and know they wonder what I am, if I am one of them. Most of them have gray hairs weaving through, through those homemade haircuts. They watch my 25-year-old ass move, tight and upright in my black stretch pants as I walk past them slowly. I want to get up there, so I walk even slower. I know what they want to ask. Polska, Ruska, Svetka, or maybe just Amerikańska. They can't tell with me. They won't ask. Instead, they stare, whisper something to see if I turn, flick ash near me to see if I quicken my pace. They want to know if I'm used to men like them. I keep my... <laughs> I keep moving slowly because I want to see if it's working. I turn my head and stare up the stairs into the twin palms. The walls are mirrored and I see the women without their furs in silk and pearls and amber, their hair in root vegetable colors, their false teeth, metal wires showing between molars. I know some of them used to be village girls back in the old country. I can tell. So my narrator, Anya, the only real job she has is calling bingo numbers. So this, this chapter is bingo. I went back to calling bingo numbers at the protection of the Holy Virgin Russian Orthodox Church. It was in Hollywood. I drove there and took Hollywood Boulevard to Argyle and stopped at the 7-Eleven nearby and always got a cherry Coke. It was a long night there on Fridays, and sometimes there were no breaks in between games. I also got a bag of Fritos. I hadn't had any in a while, so it seemed right. They were the spicy kind. I thought the ladies would miss me, but they didn't really. Someone else had started calling the numbers, a woman I knew. She only wore t-shirts with animals on them. Wolves, bears, sometimes dolphins. She wasn't happy about giving up her place to me. But I was a veteran here. I called the number slower, and the old people had gotten used to the lilt in my voice. When they called me and told me the other woman wasn't working out, that I was the only person who could handle the ladies, I strong-armed the Holy Virgin into giving me $50 a game. I climbed onto the stage of the multi-purpose room and sat down next to the large illuminated sign covered in numbers lined across and bingo spelled out accordingly. I sat behind a box full of roiling bingo balls and watched the air pressure inside the box throw the numbered balls into a tornado. The tables were long and full of women, mostly widows needing to get out to forget that their husbands were dead and gone because they still had a many many years left to live. They had photos of their men as their lucky charms, petite picture frames nestled next to small childish objects, plastic birds, broken timepieces, toy cars made by Mattel. They lined them up along the top edge of the bingo tables and spread the cards out in front of them. I began calling, B12, and then another, and then another, and then I heard the complaining beginning. The curled bouffants bobbing up and down, pecking at the numbers with their ink blotters. I was going too fast. 
They were grumbling and pecking, and finally one called out, What are you doing? You're going too fast. Have some mercy. I slowed down, N36. I drawled out the six, and I took a sip of cherry coke, my first of the night. After Rosa Schwartzberg called bingo, I called a break. There was a shuffling of cards, dirty looks aimed at Rosa. She had not stopped her winning streak. Ten dollars and a Twizzler. Single stick, not a pack. She was diabetic. I didn't understand the Holy Virgin sometimes. All these women were diabetic, still with the Twizzlers every week. I walked down to the concession table and saw eclairs, hot dogs, and bags of chips, the low-rent kind. A hot dog was $1.25, a hot dog with relish was $1.75, and I found that to be outrageous. I ate it with mustard for $1.25. The ladies crowded around the table calling out their orders. Frank from behind the table couldn't keep up. His stomach brushed up against the chocolate on top of the eclairs and stripped some off. No one noticed but me. The edges of the eclairs were now smeared and missing chocolate. I wanted one to top off the hot dog, but I saw bits of Frank's shirt fuzz captured in the remaining chocolate and just couldn't do it. He smiled at me and winked. He thought I didn't notice, or maybe did, and he wanted me to keep quiet about it. Once you got the ladies going, there was no stopping them. I ran the numbers, and he ran the stand, and we were in this together, this Friday night at the Holy Virgin. Mary pushed up against me. She was wearing a Leonardo DiCaprio t-shirt. His face stretched large over her gigantic breasts. <laughs> You're calling the numbers too fast, she said. I know I heard all of you, and I slowed down. She scowled at me. You don't have to be rude about it. Where have you been? I didn't really know what to tell her. Away on holiday with your boyfriend, she continued. I don't have a boyfriend, I said. When I was your age, I had six. <laughs> she glared at me. Her face was round and her eyebrows overgrown. She had red lipstick on, smeared on account of the eclairs she had just eaten. I thought you were already married by my age. How old are you? 25. Yeah, I was already married. And he was handsome, so handsome. He treated me like a princess, a doll. I'm sorry, Mary. You need sex, I need sex, everyone needs sex. This was a weekly thing and I was used to her frankness. I still need it. You think I don't have needs? I'm 82 and my libido is raging. <laughs> Look at Carla, 92, she wants it. <laughs> I stared at Carla, she was small, hunched over, her curled and font was tilted with her head a little to the left. I didn't think she still wanted it. <laughs> But Mary called her over anyway. Carla, how's your libido? I was starting to panic. I would have to call the numbers again in a second, and the other women were getting restless. My what? Carla stared at me. Her eyes said she still wanted it. <laughs> libido. I said libido. My husband's dead, what am I going to do? Who cares? The young ones are the ones I want. They can still get it up. The old ones just squish. You know it's true, come on. Mary smiled at me. Get a young one. You don't want to feel the squish. All right, Mary, I'll try. You can't fuck? I can tell in your hips you can fuck. She shook her head at me as I walked away. B9. They all stared at me and waited for me to call the next number. They held their blotters, shaking and salivating. Thank you.